so let's see if I got everything working here. I've got audio. I've got video. It's recording. That's awesome. Okay. Now I got to share the screen. So how's everybody feeling today? Eh? Eh? Just got eh. You know what's 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 funny for me, but really annoying for Stacy is that I am a morning person. So no matter what time I have to get up, it's like, yes, we get to meet the day. It used to be so bad that I would actually wake up singing. Bless her heart, she never threw anything at me. Yes, I did. <laughs> she missed, I guess. But uh, so so this morning in there, um, I'm actually singing the first song of the set. And it's kind of like, yes, I'm ready to praise the Lord. And I'm in there. And I realized, hey, not everybody is with me this morning. So not everybody is woken up yet. But it's it's a great song because it's one of those songs that really accentuates the idea that no matter how much we have, it's not enough. We always have to rely on the Lord to give us all that part that's missing in order to be what he wants us to be. So we actually had a, a break in the song and I was able to hopefully get that message across to everybody. Don't worry if you're not there yet, the Holy Spirit will get you there because that's, that's what he does. So this morning I am uh, going to jump through a whole bunch of judges at the same time because there's just not much mention about each of these minor judges. So because of that, I kind of wanted to give you the rest of the story about Gideon. So the story that I shared with y'all last week is the story that pretty much everybody knows about Gideon testing God, the fleece and the dew on the ground, and then selecting his 300 based on all of the things that God told him to do. And then with those 300 able to beat the Midianites. But then what happened? He started out with how many men? He started off with 21 or 22,000. I mean, okay. it was, it was a bunch. After the first cut, I think maybe he started with 32,000. I think 22,000 went home. 22,000 went home after the first cut. He only ended up with 10,000 after that and figured, hey, I could still do this with 10,000 soldiers. And then God said, no, that's, that's still too many. And so after the next cut, he only had 300 oh left to fight the entire Midianite army. Just like the 300. Like the 300. So pretty cool stuff. As we're going through these children's Bible stories, though, there is so much that gets left out. I mean, it has to, because if you don't, then you end up just reading the whole Bible to the kid. And that's, that's okay too. But there are so many deeper things that are in these stories. And that's the stuff that I really love to look at. And that's the stuff that I want to bring out to y'all this morning. Now, remember last week, one of the things that I pointed out is if we look at the map of the judges, each of these different judges, as they are raised up by God, they're in a different part of Israel. So remember, at this point, this is very early in the establishment of Israel. At this point, there's not even a kingdom of Israel yet. This is before kings. So I put up my timeline this morning, and I marked this area here in red, okay? So this is creation here. And then as you go around clockwise, you end up to like, this is about 2080, as close to now as this was in 2000, printed. 2000? So this is uh, 2080. So AD. 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 And then 2100 AD okay. is the end of, of this chart. But if you go through, you can see Adam and Eve. And I love this chart because it gives you an idea of how long that person lived before the next person was born. 
And so as these lines continue, that's how long these people were alive. So for example, that means that Adam and Eve's son, Seth, was just died when Noah was born. So as you read through the Old Testament, you know, you have all of these big events that we read and to really get a picture in your head of what, how long was this? How long? You know, it's really, really helpful. So for example, here we got Noah and he lived all the way here to 2004 BC. I think it's like 2006, 2006 BC. And then during that time, we've got all of these other biblical names that come up in our readings and you can see where they are in history at that point now what's neat is that this timeline has different colors and it tells you what different things were going on in the world so as shem ham and japheth noah's three sons scattered from where the ark landed they started the different people groups with their wives. So Shem and his line is the biblical line through which Jesus is born. We've got Ham, and we'll start seeing that Ham and his children then start bringing up other kingdoms that we see mentioned later in scripture. So we start seeing Cush, Canaan, Egypt. So down into Africa, that was Ham's descendants. And then we got Japheth, who actually went towards, he went further east, and what today we know of as Asia. That is all of Japheth's descendants in the area of Asia. And so this follows the timelines of all of those descendants and even gets into modern history. And so you can see where that modern history is in relation to everything that was going on in scripture. So for example, right here at 2204 BC, we've got early colonies to America, all the way back here. So you've got people groups that are migrating because they were told to spread, be fruitful, and multiply on the earth. And we've got people groups that then migrate through Russia, cross the Bering Strait, into Alaska and then down through Canada and North and South America start to get populated because of that. As we move down through here, you'll start seeing other things pop up that's in history. But right here, this area that I've got marked in my marker is the era, era of the judges. So if you want to, sometime after class, it'll be up here for probably two or three more weeks, give you a chance to kind of look at it. It's a really cool timeline. It's one of my favorite timelines. So not only do we have the timeline, but we also have where in the areas that were settled by the 12 tribes, all of these judges rose up. That's a cool map. So the Bible tells us that there were 12 judges. Sometimes um, scholars will say that there were 13, 14, or 15. And it just depends if you like, for example, when we were talking about Deborah, Deborah, the judge, she was also a prophetess. She was very happy just sitting there under her palm tree, helping people with their problems. When she told the general Barak that he needs to go and settle this issue, he says, I'm not going to go without you. He was actually supposed to be the one that was the judge. But because he was chicken or because he just didn't want to go without her because she was a symbol to the people, we don't know for sure. But he was, but a, general. He was a general, but he was a general of an oppressed nation. And he hadn't generaled for 20 years because okay. they were all being squashed by okay. this invading nation. So some people count Barack as a separate judge. So depending on how you want to count, but 12. And remember the judges of the biblical times is different than the judges of today, okay? They're not legal 
as far as giving law, they are passing judgment on the oppressors of Israel. That's why they're called judges. So we talked about Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. We talked about Deborah. And then last week we talked about Gideon. So we've been through five of these judges already. Gideon, of course, my favorite. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hit five, maybe six more judges today. We got Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzan, and Elon. And again, we can cover so many of them because there's really not much that's written about each of these people. So we got Abdon after that. Maybe we'll get to him today. And then Samson. Samson's who we're going to be spending most of our time on next week and most likely the week after because there is a lot to be learned from the judge, Samson. So when we get to Judges chapter 10, starting in verse 1, it says, After Abimelech died, Tola, son of Pua, son of Dodo, what names? I was like, my goodness. Was the next person to rescue Israel. He was from the tribe of Issachar, but he lived in the town of Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel for 23 years. When he died, he was buried in Shamir. That's it. That's all we get. Okay. We don't know much about him. We get two whole verses and that's it. But one of the things that I notice is that it says after Abimelech died, who's Abimelech? And so I figured, all right, I need to back up a little bit and I need to finish up Gideon's story. Gideon and his 300 men continued to chase the Midianite army east across the Jordan River. He asked for help in the name of God. He asked for food and water from the towns as he went through them. But the towns each told him, capture those Midianite kings first, then come back and we'll give you food and water and rest. And he's like, my, my people have been fighting for days. We need some food and water. Can you help us? Capture these kings first and then we'll help you. So Gideon asked for help from the towns. The elders of the towns would not step up. He asked the people of the towns to come help round up the rest of the Midianite army. They would not stand up and help. So after Gideon did go and capture the kings, he came back. With his 300 men. With these 300 men. Okay. He came back to these towns where he had asked for help. He then gathered the elders of those towns together and he beat them profusely <laughs> with briars and brambles that he picked up out in the wilderness. Since you wouldn't come with me, I brought it back to you, okay? And so he whipped them publicly and then he killed all of the men that would not stand up for God. Wow. Okay, now talking about a judge okay so god, this is a hanging judge so right god here said to do this. so what he did is he pleaded to these men stand up for your god come fight the enemy come fight the enemies of god because they did not stand up god said put them down and so gideon put them down he tore down the tower of peniel which was built to honor God. If you remember back in the Old Testament, there is a story of Jacob. So Jacob and Isaac, okay? Jacob, when he was older, had a dream with an angel, and it was actually the angel of the Lord. What did we say about the angel of the Lord? Jesus. That's Jesus. So Jacob has this dream, and Jesus is telling him, to do things and Jacob is saying no I don't want to and they end up wrestling and so basically Jacob is wrestling with Jesus in this dream and Jesus reaches over and touches Jacob's hip his thigh okay and from that point on Jacob was lame in his in that same thigh 
So basically, if you're going to strive against God, I'll teach you. And so that's what happened there. But because of this interaction that Jacob had with a pre-incarnate Jesus, he realized that that was a holy place. And so he built a tower. And that was the Tower of Peniel. And so what happens is Gideon comes back here and basically he says, you don't deserve to have this encounter with God because you've ignored God. You've not followed in his ways. And so basically he dismantled that tower that Jacob built because he felt that those people didn't deserve to have that. Okay. So he then asked the Midianite kings, the ones that he captured, why did you kill the men in the town of Tabor? Basically, they were being chased by Gideon as they were going through the town of Tabor. Basically, they just killed everybody as they went through the town. And the kings answered, because they looked like you, a spoiled son of a king. Well, obviously, that should have made Gideon laugh, because how did we find Gideon at the beginning? He was a coward. He was just a regular kid that was saying, I'm the lowest of the lowly. I'm the least in my tribe, and my tribe is the least of the nations. He was kind of threshing. Yeah, he was threshing wheat in a wine press, which, of course, doesn't get you very far. And so the fact that these two Midian kings are telling him he looks like a rich, spoiled son of kings, that's kind of funny. And he would have laughed, except in this town of Tabor, that was Gideon's hometown. And that's where his brothers and his cousins and everybody lived. And so when the Midianite kings went through the town, they basically killed all of Gideon's brothers all of his relatives. And he tells these kings, I would have let you live if you had not destroyed my family, but now you must die. And so Gideon turns to his son who was fighting with him in the 300 army. And he says, son, take your sword and kill them. And the son's like, wait, no, I don't wanna do that. He's okay fighting in a war, you know, kill or be killed. Well, now these kings are captured. And he's like, no, I, I don't want to kill them. And then the kings picked up on this and they started jeering at Gideon and saying, see, you're just a bunch of cowards. If you want us dead, why don't you do it yourself? And so Gideon says, okay, takes a sword, lops off their heads. So at that point, he gave them what they wanted. Now, the Israelites, hearing of Gideon's success, they then asked Gideon to be their king. This is before kings. If you look at the timeline, this is way before we've got King Saul and King David. And of course, Saul is the first king mm -hmm. of the Israelites. And so they asked Gideon to be their king. And he says, no, I'm not going to be your king. God is your king. So he's got the right idea. That's how that, that was supposed to be done back then. Everybody was supposed to be following the will of God as the priests tell them this is what God said. So instead for a reward, he asks all of the people, out of the spoils of war, to each give him one gold earring out of the spoils of the Midianite soldiers. The, being Ishmaelites, Arabs, the enemy all wore gold earrings. Gideon ended up with 43 pounds of gold earrings. Pounds. 43 pounds of gold earrings. He then used that gold to make a priestly ephod, which was worn by the high priests during worship. That was all laid out in Exodus 28. When Moses and the Israelites were in the wilderness and God was laying down the law of, this is how you should worship me. 
setting up all of the sacrifices and all the symbolism that was then followed in the rest of the Old Testament. So he used the gold and he made this golden ephod. Wait, the ephod is the square thing? So the, the he, thing? he made a whole like armor okay. with ephod that was built into it. The okay. ephod was a breastplate that had 12 stones in it. Each of the 12 stones represent, it's not the infinity stones. It's not, yeah. that's only five. Though. Yeah, that was only six stones. Six. So this was 12 stones, each representing each one of the tribes of Israel, okay? And it was part of worship. And so Gideon was basically saying, God is powerful. God is the one that got us through this. God is who we should follow through the priests. And so he made the high priest this ephod. Gideon lives to an old age after having many wives and 70 sons. He also had a concubine, not to be confused with the porcupine. The concubine gave him one more son, and he was Abimelech. So when we got to Judges 10, and it said after the death of Abimelech, that's Abimelech. Gideon dies, and the people start to worship the ephod instead of worshiping God. So now they're worshiping the breastplate made of gold with the 12 stones in it. And then they quickly go back to worshiping Baal, who was the God whose altar Gideon tore down in the first place. So basically, Gideon dies, and everybody just goes right back to how they were before Gideon was raised up as a judge, the cycle of the judges. So Abimelech, Gideon's son from the concubine, kills all but one of Gideon's other sons. So he kills 69 of his half-brothers. One half-brother remains Jotham. Jotham then runs up to the top of Mount Gerizim and shouts a prophecy of what will happen to the people because of their sin. And then we don't see anything else of Jotham after that. So he's a bad guy. He just killed all of Gideon's sons. He's a bad guy. They just killed a whole bunch of other people. It was okay. And Abimelech then rules in tyranny Okay. over all of the kingdoms for another three years. Okay. Okay. Now, the Samaritans consider Mount Gerizim the most holy place on earth. Samaritans are Israelite mudbloods. Okay. Did not just say I did. Mudbloods. Did so that. they are half-breeds. So during all of these times that the Israelites were taken captive, they interbred with their captors and they had children that are not pure Israelites. It's Israelites mixed with Phoenicians and Israelites mixed with all of these other people groups that were not of the 12 tribes. So the Samaritans say that all of the holy events, the holy events of the Old Testament happened here on Mount Gerizim. They said that Noah's Ark landed there no. Okay, no, they say that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac there. Um, was, no. no, and they say that the Israelites performed the rituals Moses instructed them to on this mountain before going into the promised land. Well, the Jews agree with that last one, that's true, but everything else that the Samaritans are claiming that's that's not right. So now I'm going to give my third pop reference this morning. So we've already talked about infinity stones and mudbloods. Yeah. Chekhov in Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Anytime something good would happen, he would say it was invented by a Russian. Okay. So this same situation, the Samaritans, anytime something that happened in Jewish history, the Samaritans would say, well, it happened here in our backyard. Okay. So they're, they're, it, what's that called? Cultural misappropriation. Cultural misappropriation. Okay, so that's what the Samaritans were known for. Because of this, the Israelites hated them. 
which is why when we get to Jesus's time, he's got the parable of the good Samaritan. Because there's no such thing as a good Samaritan. All the Israelites hate Samaritans. So that was a crazy story for them to hear. Also, the woman at the well in John 14, she was a Samaritan woman. And she, in talking to Jesus, was saying, our people say that the most holy place to worship is not the temple in Jerusalem, but it's here on the top of the mountain. Well, guess what mountain she was referring to? Mount Gerizim. Okay, so there is a lot of history to this mountain. So that's backstory. Now, Abimelech rules as a tyrant for three years. He eventually infuriates the people so badly that they rise up against him. He kills all of the town people of Shechem. He levels the city, and then he scatters salt all over the ground so that nothing will grow. Okay. Abimelech then moves on to the next town and he lays siege against it, pushes everybody into the gates, shuts up the gates, starts piling up wood against the walls. And just as, about, just as he's about to put fire to the wood, a widow lady is in the tower and she looks down and sees him there and she picks up a grinding stone and goes, blip, How can she pick up drops it on his head and kills him right there. To the rescue. It's <laughs> okay. So that's what went on with Abimelech. Now we get to Tola. Again, we don't know much about Tola. We got these two verses and it just says after Abimelech dies. Okay. So Tola is the sixth judge. He's the grandson of Dodo, the son of Pua of the tribe of Issachar. Again, that's all we know. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. He's from uh, Shamir, which is Ephraim. And uh, actually this area, I don't have the map here. It's close to where Bethlehem is. So where you are in Israel. He served as a judge for 23 years. We know nothing about who he was fighting. We, that's it. That's all we get. That's it. We get Jair. He's the seventh judge. He judged for 22 years. He was from Gilead. He had 30 sons who rode, rode 30 donkeys and they owned 30 towns. No story here. Okay, so, he was rich. So Tola, he was super rich. Tola died and Jair started. So they're, right. not, they're not consecutive. Um, there's some overlap because okay. there's different areas of, okay, the, of Israel cool. that they're working in. So we don't have the rest of the story. But to be listed here, he did something. Now, the second thing is that we see 30. 30 sons, 30 donkeys, 30 towns. There's got to be something about 30. I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Then we move into Judges chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. I'll read this straight out of scripture. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashtoreth and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and they no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel and he turned them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites who began to oppress them that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River in the land of the Amorites, that is in Gilead. The Amorites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and they attacked Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim. So that means now they are at war against six of the 12 tribes. So this is a big one. Wow. Okay. This is a big war. So <clears throat> Jephthah, we see him in Judges 11. So Judges 10 tells you who the bad guys are, the oppression that's going on. And Jephthah then is the next judge that God raises up. So he is a son of Gilead. 
He's also the son of a prostitute. He is a great warrior and his half brothers, when they grow up, run him out of town saying, you're not deserving of our father's inheritance. But he was first born. Even though he was born of a prostitute, he had legal right to everything his father owned. Okay. Now, just to help you out here, I was a little confused, so I had to do a bit of a deep dive here. I told you that the land was called Gilead. But now I'm saying that he's the son of Gilead. So Gilead was a part of the country that was east of Jordan, and it was named for a much older guy named Gideon, who was part of the people group that came with Moses out of the wilderness. So this is like a great, 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 great grandson who happens to still be named Gideon, but he also lives in the area that Gideon settled called Gideon. It's confusing. So, um, say again? Gilead. Did I say Gideon? I'm sorry. Gilead. Gilead. So, coincidentally, Jephthah's father was also named Gilead from Gilead. Okay? So, because his half-brothers ran him off, he then became a mercenary. And he was just a soldier for hire. And he started leading a band of mercenaries. So basically they would just go from place to place helping people out. They get paid and food and board and whatever, and then go to the next place to help them out. Kind of like the Witcher. Hmm, I had to have another pop reference there in go. there. All right. Okay. So here's what happens. The Ammonites come in, they attack the area. The elders, which were part of this group that kicked him out of town, then come to him and ask him with his guys to lead them in battle against the Ammonites. And he's like, me? You just kicked me out of town and now you're coming to me for help? And they said, yes, if you help us, we will give you whatever you want. As a matter of fact, we will make you leader over the whole country, okay? And he's like, anything I want. They said, yes. He's like, okay. So Jephthah approached the Ammonite king and he asks him, why are you making war against the Israelites in the first place, okay? Now at this point, he has no affiliation with anybody. He's a mercenary. So he's just a soldier for hire. So he was able to come up and talk to the king and the king wasn't threatened because he knew that no money had been paid at this point. The king says that the Israelites stole the land from the Ammonites and he wanted it back. Now, Jephthah, being raised Jewish, knew the story. He knew the account of Moses leading the people out of Egypt and coming to the promised land. So Jephthah recites this history of all of the peaceful attempts that Moses and Joshua and the Israelites made as they were coming up to the promised land. They were coming into this new area with 10 million people on foot. They'd send writers ahead and say, talk to them, let them know what we're doing, ask them permission to go through their country. But every time they would go and ask permission to go through the country, the king of that country would say no and make war against the Israelites as they were just trying to peacefully go through. God gave them the strength that they needed and they whooped these kingdoms every time as they were heading to the promised land. All that's in Exodus. Cool stuff. Each time that they killed the king, basically, if you kill the king of the land, you have right to conquer the land. And so basically, 
on their way to the promised land, the Israelites conquered all of the kingdoms on their way through. But they didn't stay because they were heading to the promised land. Each time the peaceful crossing was denied, they were attacked. Each time the Israelites won the battle. So it was God that took the land from these kings, not the Israelites. So this is the story that Jephthah tells the Ammonite king. He was not amused. <laughs> so at this point, he says, it doesn't matter. We're going to war. Jephthah leaves. Verse 29, at that time, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead, and from there he led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Why did he say this? When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine, dancing for joy. She was his one and only child. He had no other sons or daughters. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out, you have completely destroyed me. You've brought disaster on me, for I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. She says, Father, if you have made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me what you have vowed. For the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first, let me do this one thing. Let me go up and roam the hills and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. Okay. okay, you may go, Jephthah says, and he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow that he had made. She died a virgin. It's okay. I need to give you some clarification here. This is an example of a translation problem and social information that we don't have, okay? Because we're not Jewish, we don't understand actually what he said and what it means. According to the most accurate Hebrew scholars, the best translation of Jephthah's oath, all because of the gender of the word translated as whatever comes out of my house, whatever, mm -hmm. because of the gender of that word, the idea here is if someone came out carrying something of suitable sacrifice, it would be done according to Mosaic law. So if someone comes out with a basket of grain mm -hmm. or a, a bottle of wine, there are actually rules set up in the Old Testament of what's to be done with those items to make them sacrifices for God. We've got drink offerings. We've got grain offerings. If it's an animal that comes out of his door, okay, we know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to slay that animal on the altar as a burnt offering, okay? So that's all established in Mosaic law. Since his daughter came out holding nothing but a tambourine, there's no provision of how to sacrifice a tambourine, okay? So there's nothing suitable or honoring to sacrifice to God. Remember in Jewish law, child sacrifice is an abomination. The Holy Spirit is the one that came on Jephthah, prompting him to make this oath. So the Holy Spirit would not prompt Jephthah to make his daughter a burnt offering. It's a lot of stuff to go through, but you understand where I'm going, right? He made the vow, though. So what do you do with a living person that you have used in a vow? To God. Make sure she has 
That's what happens. Give him back to God. Okay. Basically, she was pledged to serve the rest of her life as the Jewish version of a nun. I was going to say, is that the first nun? Okay. So Exodus 38, 8, also Samuel 2, 22, calls them, quote, the women who assemble at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So there are women who are dedicating their lives to the service of the worship of God in the tabernacle. So basically, she was pledged by her father to serve the rest of her life as <coughs> one of these women of the assembly in the tabernacle. So the way we read it in English, that sounds bad. you're going to kill me and I've never had children. I'm going to die a virgin. Mm -hmm. and that's not what happened. Like right now. She was dedicated to God, basically married to the church, therefore not having any children in the human sense. You were thinking something. I was. <laughs> I was thinking that verse was like, oh, I have to kill her. But it says she died a virgin. It doesn't say, say that you killed her. It doesn't give you how much time uh, is in between. Yeah. So in our minds, we put the two together. A plus B must equal C. Mm -hmm. But it was A plus Z. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. And the other thing, what would it have benefited her to go away for two months and read that and we? She wanted to party a bit. Yeah, yeah. She just wanted a party before she was dedicated to the church, right? And so it's like a, a what's it called a rum a rum, rum spring, spring, spring. Right. Okay, it's it's that idea. And scripture also tells us that's why today Jewish girls are allowed to go party with their friends four days before they become thirteen. Basically, they before they become considered adult women, they can go and party with their friends before. What's a twelve year old gonna do? <laughs> Y'all remember though, back then 12 is not like today's 12. Those 12 year olds weren't coddled. They were already knowing what life was about because they had to. Okay. Now we, we protect our children so much. We try to keep them from growing up at all. That's why we end up with 35 year olds that still live at home. Driving their moms uh, SUVs. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope, my kids left when they were 17. <laughs> so it's become a custom in women for the young Israelite women to go away for four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. All right. Then we got Ibzon. Again, no details. Ninth judge had 30 sons and 30 daughters, and he married his children outside the clans. All right. Again. A bunch of wives, right? No details on who the enemy was. No details on what he did in order to be a judge. But these sons and daughters were married to other clans. And anything you know about kingdoms, what do you do? You marry so you can have uh, allies. Allies, peace between warring clans, power. So... 30, told you we'd come back to it. 30 is not a number that we normally would consider to be a biblical special number. It's not like three. It's not like seven, where we know that there's special symbolism in that number. But here we have Judge Jair with 30 sons who rode 30 daughters, or 30 daughters, 30 donkeys and owned 30 cities. And now we've got Ibzan here with 30 sons, 30 daughters. So what's the deal with 30? Why do we have so much 30? It's a product of three and 10. Okay. Whenever we see three, that's symbolic of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Whenever you see 10 in scripture, that is symbolic of earthly kingdoms. You see it in Revelation with the dragon with 10 heads, those are the kings of the 10 kingdoms that get set up after uh, tribulation occurs. So this is symbolic of the Trinity's rule through the governance or, or the government of mankind. So in each of these cases with 
Ibzan, and with Jair. The symbolism of the 30 is that they've got several cities or several tribes or kingdoms that they've brought together to rule in a godly way. Okay, so that's what's going on with them. In the New Testament, we see priests begin their service at the age of 30, and rabbis can begin teaching at the age of 30. Okay, it's when they're given authority through the Trinity. Okay, so that's the deal with 30. He, he was a judge for seven years. Then we got Elon, 10th judge from the tribe of Zebulun. He judged 10 years. That's all we know. And then we got Abdon, 11th judge, judged eight years. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons, and they all rode on 70 donkeys. So here we got donkeys repeated again and again and again. So back in those days, donkeys to them would be like Cadillacs to us. Okay, They were so wealthy that each of the children and grandchildren had their own donkeys to ride around. Saying donkeys represent peace, and if you had a horse, that represented war. Yep, that's a good point, too. Very good. All right, so this is just a demonstration of wealth, prosperity, and prestige. Mm -hmm. well, there's the weirdest question. Do you think the donkeys were the same size they are now? I don't know. I don't know. That'd be a genetics-type question, so I don't know. Because I had somebody tell me they're like the horses were like real short. That's why they rode chariots. That's think, not true. I don't think I'm so. I'm like, you wouldn't go charge an army with Absolutely like. Absolutely not. Yeah, horses. those, no. they got to remember that the chariots were made of like gold, gold covered mm -hmm. iron. So, so no little pony is going to be pulling a chariot. Like the so, horses. no. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, with only two or three verses that mention these so-called minor judges, you might ask, why are they even in here? We don't know who they fought. We don't know what they did. They're just in there. Basically, the best thing they were good at was making children. We got 30, 30 kids, 40 kids. It's crazy. The thing to remember here is that nothing in the Bible is put there by accident. Everything that's there is there for a reason, and there is special purpose. There's something important that God has for us to learn. The minor judges create a pulse or a rhythm throughout the book of Judges. We got Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah. She's a big one. There's a lot written about her. A lot of important stuff happens. And then we got Gideon, and then Tola, Jair, and Jephthah. And then we got Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, and then Samson. So we've got this rhythm that gets created through the book of Judges that talks about this cycle, this downward spiral that the Israelites are going through. By the time we left Joshua, the Israelites were all serving God and everything was great. And then they started spiraling away from God and they're brought back to God, but not as close to God as they originally were. Then they continue to spiral and then there's another judge that brings them back to God, but not as close to God as they were the time before. Then we've got Deborah who really revives the nation. It's a big push back to God and a nationalism to serve God. And then Gideon comes in and makes that stronger. And then we've got this downward spiral again. So by the time we get to Jephthah, he was not the goodest of good guys to start with. He was a soldier for hire. Didn't matter who he was going to kill. As long as he was paid, he was going to kill him. What's happening is the people of Israel become more and more like the Canaanites who were the people that God told them to displace in the promised land. And he told them early on, when you go into this land, kill 
every man, woman, child, and animal, killed them all, and they didn't do it. Because they didn't do it, that evil remained, and it constantly was getting foothold back into the Israelites. And eventually, over these 700 years, the Israelites became the very thing that God was trying to get them to remove. It's all because they didn't follow God's command. So some lessons that we learn by taking all of these judges as a whole, foreigners can serve as deliverers. Should have been deliverer. -er. I missed an er in there. Deliverers. Okay. So there's no such thing in worshiping God where you're not part of our people. You can't worship here. We see this all the way back in the Old Testament. Judges can act as kings by asserting status, building dynasties, and making alliances. They're arranging marriages with outsiders. When we talk about the lineage of Jesus, remember his lineage wasn't all that great. He had a prostitute in there, Rahab the harlot. He had... Um, adulteresses, there were kings who failed God terribly, all part of that lineage. These judges are representing all the tribes and the actions of all of Israel. And this progression shows this downward spiral of Israel becoming more and more Canaanite as time goes on. Okay, any questions? Pretty much wrapped up all of Judges. We just got Samson to talk about, and, and he's a story of his own. Um, a, an extra wife that's not married. So all of the kings of the Old Testament, they had three classes of women that were associated with them. They had their wives, which usually were wives that were arranged marriages in order to bring kingdoms together. They would produce an heir just so that they could produce an heir, but usually there was no love there. It was arranged in order to have a particular outcome, okay? Then you also would have the concubine. The concubine usually was the one that they fell in love with. Right. And that's the one that they really poured their emotion into. Didn't they have a queen too? Uh, the queen usually was one of the arranged marriages. Okay. Okay. Then they also would have all the extra marital type stuff. And that's where you'd have your. Uh... But they all lived there. Yeah. Yeah. The third class would rotate in and out oh my God. of the palace. What if, it was opposite? if it was opposite, there is absolutely no way. I could not deal with three. Well, three hundred. <laughs> however, many. it's Yeah, think of Solomon. That's what I'm saying. He had three hundred wives and concubines. Seven hundred concubines. Yeah. Are these uh, judges before or after the Ten Commandments? After. <laughs> yes. But that was the the way of the land at the time, so. That was one of the reasons why God told them, I don't want you to have a king. Right. One of the reasons. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Whew. And, and Solomon. I feel like I talked about 500 miles an hour. And Solomon still had a whole bunch of money left over. I don't know how that happened. God blessed him. He only got one wife. I mean, one wife that, you know, it is happening. That's true. Shoe stories and wineries. You ain't lying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions about anything? Kind of does. It kind of does. That's why I don't like the witch. Not a fan either. All right, y'all. Have a great day. The only thing that I related to.